Hi everybody, uh, we just wanted to give you guys an update on the channel and some interesting stuff that's going on. Um, I asked you guys a while back for uh, some questions so I could do a question and answer type video and by far the most common question I had on all my videos was what instrument is that? So I thought I'd take this opportunity to um, show some of the more unique instruments in my collection and also to give you guys a little bit of an update as well. Um, I did open up a Patreon page for this channel. For those who aren't familiar, Patreon is a, uh, is a service that lets users subscribe to content creators like myself and you get a little bit extra perks and you can um, you know, help me out with, uh, with some goals for my projects like getting you know, better lighting and backgrounds and things like that. One of the most common instruments that people uh, ask questions about are um, these guys here. These are called, uh, um, this instrument is called the viola da gamba. And um, it's a Renaissance instrument. It was kind of the predecessor to the violin family. Um, but it's uh, constructed a little bit more like a lute. And as you can see, it's got six strings, which is one of the more common uh, configurations for the lute. Uh, but for the most part, um, it's played very similar, similarly to the guitar in the left hand. And in the right hand, you use a bow. But unlike a violin bow, which you would hold overhand kind of like this, this one you hold with your palm facing up and you actually uh, control the tension on, your on the hair with your fingers. So it comes out kind of like this. The viola da gambas are generally held between the legs, kind of like a cello. But this one I find a little bit awkward to do that, so I've added this strap to it so that I can at least carry some of the weight on my neck and still have it in a, in a good playing position. Um, I do have two other sizes in the family, which are the more common ones um, to see, um, which are the treble, which is uh, the uh, higher pitched version of this. And that looks like this. And as you can see, it's quite a bit smaller. In fact, it's almost violin size. You could almost hold it up and play it like a violin. But it's traditionally meant to be played um, on top of the knees more than between the knees. But, um, but it's got a... It's got a little bit uh, different sound because it's got the smaller body, even though there's a large overlap between the ranges of all these instruments. Um, and then, of course, there's also the bass... Uh, the bass gamba, which is just about cello sized, and um, you probably won't be able to see all of this in frame here, but it's uh, it's roughly the same dimensions as a cello, and um, it plays in roughly the same range as well. It's also not in tune, but. Uh, <laughs> So, um, so these are the uh, the viola da gamba family, and um, they're called viola da ga gamba because gamba is the uh, Italian word for leg. So they're uh, they're violins that you play on your legs, basically. Another instrument that I get a lot of questions about um, are these uh, these woodwind instruments here. Um, and these are fairly common instruments, uh, they're recorders, but uh, a lot of people don't recognize them as such because the ones that I like to use are Renaissance style recorders. Um, the ones you're probably more familiar with are like these that uh, are commonly taught in you know, elementary schools and, and uh, for a lot of kind of beginner, beginner musicians because uh, quite frankly they're very easy to, uh, to make a decent sound on. Um, and to be honest, the uh, Renaissance instruments aren't a whole lot different in that respect. Uh, this one that I have here is an alto, so as you can see, they come in quite a variety of different sizes. Uh, this is the soprano, which is the equivalent of this one that um, everybody's familiar with. Um, so this is the soprano and the alto, and then there's also the tenor, which is a good bit bigger. And as you see, it's got this little kind of... Um, box around the bottom part here and that's just to protect some of the mechanisms down here because as you see it's got this little lever and this lever will stop the bottom hole um, and because it's got some little moving parts in there they designed this little bell to fit around to kind of protect all those little moving parts so that uh, it wouldn't get damaged and then of course we also have the bass in the family which is um, pretty considerably big um, a lot of the the more the modern instruments that they make, they'll actually make this with a um, with a uh, instead of having this neck go straight up, they'll have it come out at an angle, so it'll look kind of like a saxophone, um, where you so you'd you'd hold it up like this, and the and the uh, the end would come up towards your mouth rather than having to do it this way, which is 
a little bit more awkward, but it's a, it works just fine here. Now the other types of recorder, like this here, that um, you know, that's the, the famous school one, also comes in, in various different sizes. This is the alto of the same family, um, but these are called uh, these are what we call baroque style uh, recorders. Um, they have a little bit smaller hole. Um, if you notice on the bottom here. If I compare these two instruments together, you see that the Renaissance has a much bigger hole at the bottom than the uh, than the than the Baroque recorder does, and um, that does affect the tone a little bit. Um, the Renaissance recorders sound a little bit better in the lower ra range, whereas the uh, Baroque uh, recorders are specialized to play more in the higher range. Um, in fact, most of the the Renaissance recorders have a have. Um, certain notes in the upper range that don't even play well. Um, so they kind of effectively have a lower range than the Baroque recorders do. Um, and um, I'll play a little bit of a difference for you here, um, of comparison, so you can see the difference here. Um, so as you can see in the low range, a little bit breathy and not quite as focused of a sound, but you can go up pretty high. Whereas on the same thing on the Renaissance recorder, You can see a lot of those high notes that just kind of squeaks out and doesn't is not doesn't really have a very good presence there. But in the low range, it's got a little bit sweeter sound than the um, than the Baroque recorder does. And uh, since I've played most of these except for the bass, I'll play a little bit of the bass just because I'm sure everybody's curious about how that sounds. This is another instrument that I get asked about a lot. Um, and believe it or not, this is actually just a, um, a bass, an upright bass, which is the, uh, the lowest uh, voice in the violin family, um, although it does have ties to the viola da gamba family, which I'm not going to get into here, but just generally considered to be the lowest voice in the violin family. Um, this is a little bit different because it's a, an electric upright bass, um, which means that it's got you know, fairly, uh, it's not exactly a hollow body, but it's or not exactly a solid body, but um, as you can see, it's got a very slim profile. There's not a lot of uh, resonance that goes on actually inside the instrument. Um, most of the sound comes from the pickup, which is, uh, which is actually these little metal uh, parts mounted underneath the bridge. So um, kind of like an electric guitar pickup, it works through magnets. Um, but in this case, because the bridge is resting on uh, on these metal discs that they call diaphragms, then um, the pickups can actually um, sense the vibration of the bridge rather than the string directly. So it's got a little bit different sound than, than a traditional electric guitar pickup would. Um, and um, this particular model was based off of a, um, an old uh, model that was made by Ampeg in the 60s and 70s. Um, Ampeg is, of course, really well known as a maker of bass, bass amps, um, but in the day they actually made quite a few instruments as well. And this particular design was actually made before um, the electric bass guitar was invented um, and was actually kind of one of the first um, um, instruments that was made to be amplified um, as a bass instrument. Um, this, ins this particular model, um, because of the pickups, became very popular, um, not so much with jazz uh, players who like more of that uh, really kind of uh, buzzy, growly sound, um, but it became really popular with, um, with a lot of Latin jazz and salsa players because it has a very thumpy, percussive sound. Um, one of my side projects, as uh, I may have mentioned before, is, uh, is doing salsa and Afro-Cuban uh, music. So this is perfect for that, but it also comes across really well in, in these kinds of um, uh, covers that I do. Um, one of the reasons that uh, I like this pickup too is because it sounds very well with the bow. Um, and as you can see, I've got a five string variant instead of just the standard four strings. So even with the bow, I can make use of an extended range that, uh, that 
you know, for an average bass, you'd either have to do an alternate tuning or you'd have to get an extension. Um, a lot of classical players will have an extension that um, that extends the fingerboard for the lowest string only um, so that they can play below what the normal string is, but then they'll have a little um, holder that holds it in place if they don't need it so they can kind of go between standard and, and different kinds of drop tunings, as they would be called in guitar, uh, easily. But in this case, just having a... Um, uh, a lower string will give you just as much range um, uh, without needing any kind of additional scroll work up there. All right, so I hope you enjoyed um, this little session where I explained some of my uh, more unusual instruments that I have in my collection. Um, I did have a couple other questions that I wanted to, uh, to answer here as well. Um, I had somebody ask whether I own all these instruments, um, and the answer is most of them, but not all of them. Um, some of them, especially the uh, the Renaissance instruments like the uh, the alto sac butt and the uh, the Renaissance recorders I have, um, I actually have those on loan from a local early music group that I that I play in. Uh, if those who, are, who aren't familiar with the term, early music generally refers to Renaissance and earlier um, medieval type of uh, music played on uh, on original instruments, and we try to kind of get as close as we can to how an actual ensemble would have sounded back then. So it's kind of a, uh, you know, a music nerd type of thing, but I, I have a lot of fun with it. And obviously it gives me access to some interesting instruments that, uh, that I can make use of in recordings. Um, I had another person ask uh, what my first instrument was, and that was the violin. The violin was the first instrument that I, that I ever played. Um, I started studying that when I was 10. Um, and I started studying that because I was just being a lazy kid one summer, and my dad said that I should do something productive, like learn to play the violin. So I took him at face value and learned to play the violin. And from there, I, I realized that I kind of enjoyed it. So um, from there, I moved on to other instruments. Um, um, nowadays, mostly I play viola and bass. Uh, viola is my main classical instrument. I switched to that when I was in college um, and found that I ended up liking that even more than violin. Um, the viol, of course, is the uh, is the alto voice of the violin family, so it's a little bit lower than the violin, but you still play it under your chin. Um, and then um, I also do a lot of commercial music, like I mentioned, the salsa and other things like that, um, on bass, um, because I've always found that the bass is a very important role in the music, and if the bass isn't played well, then it can spoil everything else. So I kind of like being able to take on that responsibility and and make as many other people sound good as possible. Um, all right, I also want to talk a little bit about uh, the Patreon that I've set up. Um, I have um, three tiers of subscriptions. Um, for as little as a dollar a month, um, you can get access to uh, the sheet music for all the, all the arrangements that I've done here. Um, that also will give you uh, the opportunity to vote in polls that I put up about, you know, which videos to do next or, uh, you know, things of that nature. Um, I also have a $3 a month subscription, which um, gives you access to the uh, recordings as well if you wanted to download, download those onto your, uh, onto your own computer or your own device. Um, and then I also have a um, $30 um, package, which basically lets you um, tell me which song that you want to hear, and I will guarantee to record it within reason. You know, I'm not going to record an entire Beethoven symphony for you, but uh, but anything that I can plausibly do, um, I will go out of my way to do that. Um, you know, uh, at least one a month for for uh, the people that have uh, that have chosen that that package. Um, and uh, the reason that I'm that I'm doing this is because you know I am a working musician, and um, I really have to prioritize certain kinds of uh, gigs over other ones and I really want to prioritize this one but at the moment it's just a hobby so if um, if I get enough people supporting me on Patreon then I can make this a um, something of a regular gig for me and then I can put a lot more effort into and make the channel a lot better even for those people who aren't subscribing. So I hope you enjoyed this video and um, there will be uh, links for um, for the Patreon and um, any other information that um, that you need in the uh, in the description down below. So check that out and uh, share this with your friends if you have anybody that would be interested in this kind of thing. Thank you.